we continue. We are almost done with the book of Colossians, uh, so we're nearing the end of that. Um, but that doesn't mean we're going to be done here. We're going to uh, still be meeting, and we'll have other uh, things lined up as we've been uh, bantering back and forth uh, some of the uh, things to, to talk about and mention. So I uh, want to encourage you guys to keep coming and, and showing up, and hopefully you've enjoyed the, the study in the book of Colossians and really have taken time outside of Tuesday nights to dive in um, because what we do here tonight or on Tuesday night is just really tipping the iceberg and kind of getting a peek into it, and there's so much that to uh, discuss. So um, let's go ahead and open up prayer, and then we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Father, I want to thank you. Thank you for your presence here. Uh, we, we do invite you to um, uh, this room and, and online uh, for your presence. Lord, I pray that you would go before me, whatever words uh, come from this feeble body, they would be your words, that your heart, your message would come across. Um, Lord, may our ears be open to your truth, may our eyes be open to the reading of your word, may we internalize this uh, passage tonight, may we understand what it is that you're trying to teach us and show us and to build us and strengthen us in our faith and in our confidence in being able to speak truth into others. Uh, Lord, I do pray that um, each one of us would um, be drawn closer to you, that you would be working in our hearts, that you would be uh, disrupting our lives with grace and mercy um, so that you could be building in, a, building in us the men of God uh, you have designed and plan for us to be. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right. Uh, again, uh, pretty much light on the announcements. We're going to keep rolling in the book of Colossians tonight. Um, we're going to be in Colossians 3, starting in 22. But before we start um, and end chapter 3 and actually begin chapter 4, I just want to spend a couple minutes uh, framing up the book of Colossians and where we've been, because I think now you'll start seeing the outline of what Paul is writing uh, about. In, in the beginning of the book, he opens up with you know, a gratitude of the faith of the church of Colossae. Remember, he's writing from Ephesus to a church uh, in Colossae. He's thanking them for their faith and, and praising them. He's praying for them for growth. He's also... Um, Summarize Christ's character. So he's talking to the people. He's summarizing who Christ is and what he's done for us. And then in chapter 1, if you recall, he gives a very you know, intimate look into his calling and his conversion of, of what his message is and what he's been called uh, by Christ and by Jesus to do in his preaching and in his teaching. It's a very, um, it's a very personal a glimpse inside of Paul's mind there at the end of chapter 1. Chapter 2, he moves on and says, okay, you've got the foundation, you know who I am, but I want you to understand that this Christianity, this faith that I'm talking about is far superior than anything you see in society. He talks about, you know, the, 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 the pitfalls and the uh, all the things that this world thinking can't deliver, such as philosophy and legalism he addresses in chapter 2. In chapter 3, he also, or chapter 2, he's also talking about mystical teachings that were prevalent in, in the culture at that time. And then he even talked about self-discipline, and we think of self-discipline as, hey, working out or denying, and, and it goes beyond that. There were cults of people that would physically harm themselves, and, and yet the physical fitness and stuff was still part of the Roman culture as well. And that was in chapter 2. And in chapter 3, he moves from, he sets the stage. Okay, you know who I am. You know what I, all these things that don't work. Now let's talk about your calling as a man. Um, he talks about our calling in Christ. And the first thing he talks about, and we saw that early in chapter 3, was what? Who, who remembers the first thing he said? Hey, we need to shed the old man, Right? Put off the old man. And what was that old man? We, we talked about um, 
those things that we are supposed to get rid of, immorality, impurity, verse 5, passion, um, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. Um, Put them aside. In verse 8, he goes on and says, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Don't lie to each other. All these things he's saying, that's the old man before Christ. And we are to take that off. We are to relieve ourselves of those things, those character traits that we embraced and fed as someone who doesn't follow Christ. And we are to instead put on the new man, right? And he goes on and, and talks about that new man later in chapter 3. And it says, um, verse 12, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiving each other, 14, put on love, 15, be thankful, right? So he's saying this is what it looks like to be a new man. And Steve did a great job outlining a lot of those things uh, as we went through those in chapter 2 or chapter, early chapter 3. And then he says, okay, you've got that new man on now, right? We've taken on and put on that new man. And Paul moves on and says, now let's talk about your relationships, And Dustin brought that to us last week, and he talked about what should our relationships look like as a man. And he talks about our relationship as a husband, as a son, and honoring your parents, right? And and your position as a father, don't exacerbate your children and drive them to sin, right? So he talks about our relationships with others. And tonight, we're going to talk about that next tier of relationships that he's talking about outside of the family unit. However, I would be doing the scriptures an injustice if I didn't speak to you in the way that they are written. Because the first word of our passage tonight is a term that we need to understand biblically. And that term in verse 22 says slaves. Bond servants, as in your translation might say. And I think it's really important as you study the scripture and you have a doctrinal foundation of how the scripture outlines, we need to put in context that term slavery. Because we are probably, many of us, including myself at times, will look at this and say, oh, Paul is condoning slavery. He's addressing it with no anti-slavery movement. He's talking about it contextually in the form of normal everyday relationships as something to be accepted. And so if you're not condoning it, you must, or if you're not condemning it, you might be condoning. And that's not the case when we understand what the scriptures say and what slavery is in the Bible as opposed to our distorted view of uh, more recent history of slavery that is completely non-biblical, right? Um, There were times, and you'll see it in the Old Testament, of how slavery or bond servitude is addressed. And I think it's just important to step back for a minute, a little bit of history lesson, but it's not for history so that you understand it and just to know something. It's to understand it in the biblical context so that you can defend the scriptures. You're going to have the conversation, if you haven't already, saying, well, look, Paul talks about slavery all the time. In fact, if you read most of his letters, he spends more more time and discussion on slave-master relationships than he does the family. Just part of his writings, because it was contextually relevant in that culture today. But you see, in the Old Testament, under the Mosaic Law, there's written pieces about slavery. And, you, and yet it's not in the same context as what we think about when we think about American history slavery and the deplorable acts of this country. Because that was unbiblical to so far extreme. So what was the biblical context of it? Well, we live in an imperfect world and God was dealing with how we live, how we are called to live in an, in an ungodly world. 
And that's the point of slate, you know, the to talk about it. He put guardrails in it and said, hey, this is, these are the rules around it. And when you study the Mosaic Law, if you go back to Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and study it, you, you understand that there were strict guardrails around it. And there were certain things that were not permitted. And, and, and it distorts our view when we just use the same word slavery biblically or slavery in the New Testament. How did one become a slave? You, you, there's multiple ways. The most popular way in the Old Testament and even in Paul's time was what they call um, debt slavery. I couldn't afford to pay my bills or taxes, and I sold myself into slavery. That was probably the most common way that people voluntarily entered into it to avoid or to work off their debt. Now, in the Old Testament, you'll read that slavery had a time limit. It was a period of six years, seventh year, you're free. So nowhere was it ever legal to be long-term, forever type of slavery, right? It was a, a time period to work off your debt, um, and that was the purpose. Another way someone might become in, into slavery, um, prisoner of war. Because a lot of times your choice was uh, death, or you can be a slave for a number of years and work your f freedom. What would you choose? <laughs> right? Um, that was your choice, either death or become a slave. And so people chose that. We know that there are um, times where you see uh, bandits would sell people. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Um, most Probably one another common way was kids were born into it. People went into slavery and people were born. So there was this system. It doesn't mean God condones it. He doesn't. It means that was the system. And so God put guardrails of how we should be living in that context. If you want one verse in the entire Old Testament on how God feels about it, uh, I would um, call you to, uh, I think it's Exodus 21, 16. Exodus 21, 16, very simply says this. Um, this is, um, uh, oh, I'm in, maybe not, it's not going to be in Leviticus, John. Exodus 21, 16. Let's go back to Exodus. It says, and he who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him, or he is found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. You think God is condoning slavery? Capturing, stealing another man and putting him into slavery or selling him? That's a capital punishment. So there were guardrails, I would say, I'll use that word, guardrails of how slaves were to be treated. In fact, in the Old Testament law, if they were beaten or injured, if they injured themselves or were beaten by the master, they were supposed to be freed. If a slave ran away, they were supposed to be called declared free if they were able to run away. So there, are, there were guardrails about slavery. And I'm saying all this because I need us to have a mindset when we read the New Testament and we read slave master, be a bondservant, you know, be a slave to righteousness talks about it. We need to understand biblically what this is talking about. There were punishments if they misbehaved or mistreated slaves uh, that were supposed to happen. Even in Rome, uh, Roman rule did not allow for the buying and selling of slaves. It was illegal. Did it did happen, yes, but it was illegal. So there were some rule sets around this. But if you read the New Testament, you see Paul, James, Jude, Peter, all refer to themselves as what? Bond slaves or bond servants to Christ. And what is that bond servant? What is that person? It's a property holding no right to leave his place of service. That's what it means. And they identified them with themselves in the context of their relationship with Christ, meaning it's no longer I, it is I who live, but you know, Christ lives through me. I'm identifying with him as someone who rules me. Even Jesus used 
uh, slaves in a parable, the parable of the talents, right? He's using in the context, some of you say, well, Jesus didn't condemn slavery. He used it in his parables. No, he, he, he wasn't condoning it, but it wasn't an anti-slavery movement because of the context of what slavery looked like in the Old Testament and in the Scriptures. In fact, the New Testament affirms that, uh, the Old Testament. Um, in, in 1 Corinthians 7.21, it actually talks about um, if you're able to get free, do so, right? Paul's saying, if you can get free, you know, that's the better thing. Um, and yet, in Romans, it says we're called to be slaves to righteousness. So it was, in, in throughout Scripture, it's, it's, how, it's God telling us how we are to live godly lives in an in, in godly or an ungodly world. So that's the, the context behind that. Um, so that. So that's the first word of our text tonight. We only have, I don't know, what, 75 more words to go. <laughs> so I, it, does that help understand, to put it into context, the, the, the slave piece? So um, and what it means from a bond servant standpoint? Because um, I, I, I found that very interesting, and I struggle with that word because in our society, in our culture, when you say, I'm a slave to Christ, oh, so, you know, so socially, what, what, what does that mean, right? It's because we use it in a different way. But in, in no way um, does the scriptures um, talk about or condone um, slavery in any way. And especially, there is no uh, scriptural text that would support the American history view and, and treatment of that term and then that, that reality. So let's dig into um, our scripture. Um, there's probably a few other ones I want to uh, dig into uh, as we dig, dig here a little deeper. So first, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. And let me read through verse uh, 1 of chapter 4, and then we'll go back and unpack a little bit here uh, some of the points made. Uh, verse, starting again in verse 22. Slaves in all things... Obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Okay, let's go back and unpack a little bit. Um, in verse 22, he's talking directly to the slaves, saying, hey, Obey your masters, your earthly masters, right? Um, he's saying that uh, we're to do so with an attitude of understanding that that, that is our mission field. We, and, and look, we can take the scripture today, we, you know, fortunately, we don't have that indentured servitude, let, you know, slave-master relationship. What do we call it today? Work. Work. Yeah. <laughs> you have an employer employee relationship, right? So is there anybody, maybe there's a few that are independent workers that have no employees or no boss, and then essence, you also have no customers because your customers help dictate to you, you know, how you're to work, right? Customers the boss. <laughs> customers the boss in a lot of cases. So this, we take this trans, we take this text and we put it into Hey, how are we to have and look at these relationships outside of our home that we talked about last week in a work environment, right? So I'm not limiting it to just the old or the New Testament slaves master. Today we would look at this and say, wait a minute, these are your relationships with how you work and who you work for. Because remember, the indentured or in debt slave was working off his freedom. Sounds like work today, right? Working towards our retirement. Just replace the words. 
So it says to, we are to obey those on, uh, masters on earth with that external service, but not just to please them, but with sincerity of heart. That's your mission field. That's my mission field. And, and we can get into all the, the, the legal things of not allowed to do this, not allowed to have that conversation. Not, you, know, you, can't, you can't say that. You can't meet here. You can't bring your Bible. You can have all those conversations. But you can still live a godly life, and that is our mission field. The people that we work with, um, the people that we uh, interact with throughout the day. 1 Corinthians um, uh, 10.31 says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, it doesn't say whatever you do at home, or whatever you do on your hobbies, whatever you do at your leisure time, whatever you do, sounds to me like that includes our job, Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of the many. Why? So that many might be saved. That's our mission field. We are to do good. We are to give our best. We are, we are to not say good enough. We're not to say, it's better than his, so it's good enough, I'm done. You know, does our work reflect our testimony, or does it cause others to stumble? Do, do others look at you and say, you clock out early, and you, you, you pilfer from the, the company cupboards, you steal time, money, resources from the company. You lie on your expense report. I remember, true story, I got hired at GM. I was living out in California, and, um, you know, they, I, had, I was traveling. I was in the field sales organization, and, and, and they said, hey, um, I, we can't accept this expense report. And I'm like, why not? And they said, because you had a $3 breakfast. And I'm like, yeah, I did. I went through McDonald's and got an Egg McMuffin and a coffee. And like, no, 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 no. Don't mess it up for the rest of us. That needs to be 10 or 12 bucks. And, and I'm like, wait a minute. That's, that's, that's not what I did. And they're like, that's what, that's what we do. And I'm like, that's not what I do. And that's not what I'm going to do. And so do, do we do that? Do, how do we treat the company that we work for, and lie, cheat, steal from them? How about your tax returns? Overstate your incomes? Maybe understate them for tax credits? Put a few exemptions on there that don't exist? Does our testimony at work hold up, or does it cause somebody else to stumble and say, you're really no different than anybody? I remember going in, in the field organization, you'd go to hospitalities, and they'd have all that stuff going on, and I would see people ordering in all kinds of liquor <laughs> and telling, don't open those, because they were going to go put them in their bags and take them home. I mean, that's the reality of the world, right? Fortunately, a lot of that stuff is gone these days, but what, what's your testimony look like in, in with how you work uh, with others? Do you do your best all the time? Do you cut corners? Have you ever said, good enough, I'm out? Or is it is it your very best? And is it with the sincere heart? So it talks about the sincerity of our heart in that endeavor. We, un we need to understand that our work, or what we do, is an act of worship. It is an act of worship towards God. And so we, we need to look at it from, hey, we... We serve whoever we serve as a work employer relationship, employee relationship. But we need to be doing it with sincerity and love that says, I want to get up and I want to do my very best for that tyrant that you work for. And who hasn't worked for one? Right? Evan, you got to pass. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He still works for a tyrant. It's called Tony. <laughs> He's got a job. Okay. So the point being is, hey, we, we all have them. And if you don't, right now, you probably will again. 
But how do you approach that? Do you work with sincerity and, and knowing that they can do whatever they want because I'm serving the Lord. This is for Him, right? Verses 23 and 24 uh, together. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Ecclesiastes uh, 9.10 says, Whatever you, your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And this goes along that same lines of, I'm, gonna, I'm all in. Like, you guys that know me, I'm a type A. You know, surprise. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm all in. All the time. And, and, and that's the way it is. Um, but I can tell you that now there's times at work where I'm like, ship it. Good enough, right? Got that file done. Ship it. Good enough. And, and sometimes there's time pressures and the boss says, look, this is plenty, you know, but let's, let's get moving. But are we, whatever we put to our hands, is it, is it the best? Are we to live that exemplary life? Um, so that's um, th those verses. Um, we, and the reason that he talks about there is that we're serving the Lord, right? It's Christ. So what's that, where should our focus be? Our focus is on the eternal, not the temporal. The temporary things of this world, you know, whether it be the money, whether, whatever it might be, those are the temporary things. But if we're serving the Lord, we're, we're, our focus isn't even on this world. Our focus is on the things of heaven, right? Because we're not serving, we're not doing this for show here on earth, we're doing it for the Lord. First Peter um, two twelve. Um, says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may on account of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So let our, ex our behavior be excellent to those around us. Do we go to work grumbling and complaining? Do we slander our boss, our company? Do we? Do we talk bad about them? Around other people? Guilty as charged. Look, <laughs> you know... Um, there's been times where you're like, man, I can't believe that guy. He's a tyrant. You always have a better idea than your boss. <laughs> yeah, your yeah, ideas are better, always better than your boss's ideas. Um, but that we're to live excellent, right? When the boss is being a tyrant to everybody, it's like, hey guys, this is he's the boss. That's why you know it's his sandbox, his toys. We're, we're, we're to do it and do it with love, with sincerity. Um, you know. Scriptures call us to be obedient, right? And what does it say in John 14, 15? If you love me, you will obey me. What's that? Obey my commandments, right? Um, obedience to the Lord conveys more um, than the words. It conveys that you love and trust him when we're obedient to him. And he's telling us to be obedient to those whom we work for. In verse uh, 25, um, it says, uh, For those who do wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Um, you know, that's kind of a... I looked at that as a negative sentence. There, you could reverse the thought that Hey, when it's Christ we're serving, and we have a great attitude towards it. Um, but in the end, no partiality. Slave and master, they're all in the same boat. Because um, Christ doesn't distinguish between the two. Um, in fact, the dis there is no distinguishment between the role um, nor and, and the worth of somebody. Right? There. There's a distinction of the role does not mean your distinction of worth. So whatever position you are in Christ, 
Because remember, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. There is no, neither Jew, nor Gentile, nor slave, nor free man. What, what Paul is actually setting up here scripturally was the foundation that did away with slavery across the globe. Now, we still have it in some parts of the world, right? It wasn't the anti-slavery movement, but the fundamental issues of what he's saying here of no distinction. Everybody's in the same boat. And it's actually the scripture, and the, the scriptures set the foundation for doing away with it as, as a uh, piece or as a uh, way of life. Um, verse uh, 4, 1 says, Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Basically, now he's turned the table. In the first few verses, he's all addressed slaves as to what you're supposed to do. If you work for somebody, this is what you're to do and how you are to behave. Now he's turned the table and he said, Okay, masters, people that have workers or people that report to you, or if you have somebody, you lead a team or you're a boss or, or you do something, he's saying, okay, now I'm going to talk to you. I want to address you. And I want you to understand how to be just and fair. Now, this is a really important verse in, in the book of Colossians because it accompanies a verse later in chapter, or chapter 4, verse 9, when it mentions a man by the name Onesimus. Onesimus, an entire book, was written to address Onesimus. That's the book of Philemon. If you go now, because, so Paul's in Ephesus, he's sending a letter to Colossians. He's also, the church of Colossae, he's also sending a letter and several people with that letter. And one of the other letters that he's being sent is the book of Philemon. And Philemon was a member of the church of Colossa. Onesimus was a runaway slave. He was Philemon's slave. He was a runaway slave who had an encounter with Paul. And so Paul, he runs into Paul. I'm imagining a, an incredible conversion. And Paul is now sending Onesimus back to Philemon, a member or a citizen of the, the Colossal, uh, that city, Colossa, the church there. And he's saying to him in verse, because uh, it says in verse 9, it says, And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they will inform you about the whole situation here, right? I'm talking to him. But if you go to the book of Philemon, I'm going to, yeah, it's right before Hebrews, right? Which now my Bible is, huh? Uh, there's only one chapter in Philemon. There's only 25 verses. So he, he's had a conversion. Onesimus has had a, a conversion. So verse 16 um, he says, no longer as, or so verse 15 says, for perhaps he was for this reason parted from you for a while that, he should, that you should have him back forever. Meaning, again, he was going to work for the uh, Philemon, work off his time, but instead he ran away, got converted, ran into Paul. Now Paul is saying, you're not done. You need to work off your debt. You need to go back to Philemon as a slave. And so he's sending them back, but he's pleading, the book of Philemon is pleading Philemon to embrace him, not, what does it say, verse 16, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, Paul, he's saying, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And in the Lord. So he's saying, he's no longer a a slave to me, I don't look at him that way, he is a brother in Christ. So he's making a plea to Philemon to receive Onesimus in that manner. 
history, if you outside of the scriptures, history will tell you that Philemon restored him as a brother, did that, and Onesimus became the pastor of the church of Colossae. So that the, the, there's a massive transformation in that life and a massive um, shift in the thinking of how we are to think about slaves. The other part, too, to understand that in, in some of the history of slave master, there were um, uh, inanimate objects. There's like three levels of how they view things. Inanimate objects, you know, think, you know rocks or whatever. Um, slaves and then people, right? So, so they were just above, they were considered tools. Possessions. They were considered tools. No, no, no voice, no, no ability to have your words you know, embraced or your thoughts. You were a tool. And what he's saying is, no, no, embrace him as a brother. Um, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, slavery back then, it didn't, you know, it wasn't ethnic or racial or it wasn't a people group. Rome was an equal opportunity slave company or country, right? It didn't matter. It was, if you were in debt, you were in debt. It didn't matter your race, your ethnicity, your nationality or anything like that. And, and so your cultural stigma of it was, you know, I think of it today as um, somebody that goes through bankruptcy. <laughs> you know, you might have a little stigma, but at the end of the day, when you're out of it, you're out of it, <laughs> right? It's kind of like, okay, move on. Same thing with slavery. You served your time, you did, you did whatever, and you worked your, your freedom back. So it didn't have that long-term stigma that we, we tend to think of when we think of slavery. But Paul was absolutely uh, telling the, the people to, Embrace these brothers. And as a master or somebody, if you have people that work for you, are you empathetic? Or are you the tyrant that they talk about? You know, the, that, that type of ruler over people. Um, do you love on them in a way that would help them see Christ in us, right? Um, but the scriptures are absolutely against uh, slavery. In fact, I want to point your attention to um, one other passage in 1 Timothy. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, if I could. I found this fascinating. Um, you know, I was doing my study. Uh, you know, Paul writing an, another letter and, and, and just lining up um, the, the scriptures against slavery. And in verses, starting actually, I think in verse um, 8, it says, But we know that the law is good for one, if one uses it lawfully, realizing that the fact of the law is not made for a righteous man, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and the profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers or murderers, and immoral men, and homosexuals, and kidnappers, and liars, and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which, with which I have been entrusted. I find it fascinating in, in that First Timothy passage. In my passage, it uses kidnappers. But the actual word is men-takers, man-takers, slave traders. And so, and, and, and the cool thing about this passage is that Paul is actually bringing out, he's applying sin that he sees in society to the Old Testament Ten Commandments. He's, he's giving you a visual of what that looks like. So, for instance, um, when he says, one translation, uh, he says, for those who kill their fathers and mothers. It's speaking against what? The fifth commandment, we are to honor our father and our mother, our parents. So he's saying, hey, the law is for the people that do all these things, against these things. And it says, for murderers. Uh, that's the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not murder, right? In verse 10, the sexual immoral for those practicing homosexuality. That's the seventh commandment on purity. And, and then the eighth commandment, He's talking about slave traders. 
or those that steal, man stealers, st- those that steal men. And so he's, he's giving, you know, applicable sin of the society as it relates to the Ten Commandments. And what he's saying is, you don't confirm, you don't affirm homosexuality or murder, so why would you affirm slavery? Because if you affirm one, you're in jeopardy of opening the door to affirm others. So that he's really putting down the doctrinal passages saying, no, 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 no. These things are wrong. Thou shalt not commit murders. And he's saying in, in, in there in verse you know, 8, 9, and 10 that the, this is what the law is made for. It's for those that go, are not righteous. So the, the scriptures have a lot to say, and I think it's really important for us to understand that when we say slave or bondservant, scripturally, it's different than what we think of here in America. Uh, because somebody might tell you, oh, the Bible teaches slavery was okay. No, it doesn't. It, li- it, it shows us how to live in the context of an ungodly world, of a world that is divisive um, and goes against his word. So I want to break out some time. Uh, I want to give you guys the rest of the time to uh, talk about these things and, and these passages. Um, I want you guys to talk about your attitude, your, your, your work uh, towards, you, you know, and how it applies or how it affects your testimony. Does your testimony align with that? Um, the reality is, are there work relationships that you need to deal with and to resolve? I, I've told the story before, I don't know if I've ever told in this group, that uh, years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I had a work relationship that went bad. And I held animosity towards this individual for months. Not proud to say this, but for months I, I held animosity against this person. And let me tell you, it, it did not sit well with me for that whole time period. God churning in my life, and I saw him, and I knew exactly what I was doing. And I was in sin, and I had to come to grips with that. And, and restore my relationship with Christ as well as the relationship with that person. But would your coworkers or boss agree with your self-assessment of your alignment? Talk about that. And talk about the fact that we are called to be a bondservant, a, a, a slave to righteousness. Um, look, I've, we, we've been through a lot in the last year. As a society, as a community, as brothers, we've, we've seen a lot. I'm going to get real for a second because there are men that I have called brothers. And I have seen their testimonies blown in the past year, in the past months. And it hurts, it's painful to see that, um, where they've been caught up and some things that we're not called, up, called to be caught up into. We're told how to live a godly life in an ungodly world, not to fix everything, not to take platforms, but do your social media posts, do your water cooler conversation, do your jokes. Does what you listen to, your other behaviors, does it align with your testimony? on who you serve. Because whether you're an employee or an employer, you serve someone. So talk about those things. And, um, you know, you got about a half hour, I guess, right, Steve, before we're done? Um, and uh, other than that, thanks, guys. All right.